God is the joy and the strength of my life. You know, we as Christians are so forgetful. Sometimes we need reminders. And so here we have this incredible truth. God is. But we worry about what's going on in Washington, and we forget that God is. We worry about what's going on in our streets and in our homes, and we lose sight of the fact that God is. God is our all in all. It means that there's nothing to fear, nothing to be anxious about. I know that you must feel at times that the, the animals have taken over the zoo, but you have forgotten that they're all on a leash. You can't control how far they go, but you certainly don't have to worry about them. And the amazing thing is that it all works out in the end. Oh, but you're saying it's really difficult and how much time it's going to take. And I thought about that. Even as I was looking at Psalm 90 and 91 and 92 and talks about the fact that God gives us three score and ten. And that if, if it happens, we might get four score. Or we might make it to 80, or we might make it to 90, and we think, woohoo! And then I think about the fact that 90 is, is a drop in the bucket when we think about how long we're going to be there and how long we're going to praise the Lord. And so it seems that we ought to be able to endure for a minute if we're going to praise Him for eternity but we are in our feelings. So I want to uh, address that today. I want to address this idea that there is a difference between protection and security. There's a difference between protection and security. I'm going to suggest that we are protected. We just don't feel secure. That's not on him, that's on us. And so I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Psalm 91. We're going to read the entire psalm. And I hope that you have spent some time with it, because we're going to spend some time with it this morning. Ad nauseum. Psalm 91, beginning at verse 1. And if you're there, please say amen. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper. And from the deadly pestilence, he will cover you with his pinions And under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on it with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. They get theirs. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion, and the serpent you will trample down. 
And then God himself speaks. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. I want you to look at your neighbor on the left or on the right, and I want you to say, devil, you can't touch this. You have to understand. You cannot know who God is until you know who you are. And we have forgotten. And so we're going to call it into your remembrance. Would you bow with us as we pray? Father, thank you so much for your goodness and mercy and your kindness toward us. I pray that you would open up the eyes and the ears of our understanding. Illumine us. Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding beyond what we are able to naturally comprehend. Father, the anointing that breaks yokes and that pulls down strongholds, may it rest on this house today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, and thank God. You, you can sit down. It's, it's deeply troubling when you see someone who should know better, but they don't do better. And so I think that the case for us with believers is that we know better, but we don't do better. I'm going to suggest to you that we have a delusion. During World War II, there was a soldier that got separated from his unit and he was fighting in the Pacific Theater, and it was a mountainous region, and he could not get reconnected with his comrades. And he was in an area of high enemy concentration. The battle was raging, and so he climbed up this cliff, and he secreted himself in one of the caves that was there. He could hear the enemy activity. He could hear them climbing up the hill, and so there, as he lay holding his rifle, he whispered a prayer to God to say, God, would you protect me while I'm in this cave? And then he waited for the enemy to come. But while he was coming, while the enemy was coming, he noticed that a spider started to weave a web across the mouth of the cave. And he chuckled a bit to himself. And he said, God, I need a brick wall. And you sent me a spider web. He said, but nevertheless, I love you, and I'm just going to wait to see what you are going to do. The soldiers came, and they were searching every one of the caves, and they got to his cave, and they saw the spider web over the cave. And they said, nobody could be in here. They would have broken the spider web. So they didn't even bother to go in. And the man lay there safe, and he said, God, forgive me. I forgot that where you are, a spider web is like a brick wall. You have to understand that God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. We face difficulty on every hand, and yet we forget about how God may have delivered us. Sometimes I, I, I'm driving my car and, and I get home and I find out that there's a nail in my tire. And I've been all over the expressway and I've been all over town and my tire just stayed inflated and then it decided to go down in the garage. And I was tempted to say I was lucky. But the fact is, my God is watching over me all the time. The problem is that sometimes I forget. Why do I forget? I forget because God has made me too capable. God has given me 
um, 25 or 30 years of experience in ministry. He's given me 25 or 30 years of experience in industry. And there's time that I will actually fall back on my experience. But what God is trying to do is he's trying to divest me of all that I know and all that I'm able to do so that he can fill me to overflowing with his presence and that I will never try to do it in my own strength. See, you can't burn out if God is doing it. Only people who are working in their own, if you are tired of your marriage, then you're trying to do it on your own. If, in fact, you are offended by something that's going on in your home, it is because you don't have that winsomeness of Christ because he puts up with you. We actually have the audacity to judge other people. And if there's anybody who needs help, okay. Take your phone out, take a selfie, and then look at the selfie. That's the person who needs the help. So as we go through this text, I want you to understand that there is a difference between safety, protection, security, because it's your perception. It is what you believe about what God is doing. As we examine Psalm 91, I want you to see that it doesn't matter whether God gives you a brick wall or a spider web, that he is able to do the same thing with both. Okay, there are three serious principles that emerge from this text, and I want to give you all three right at the, at the beginning. The first is that you will not worry about whether you have a brick wall or a spider web when you find comfort in his presence, when you can place your confidence in his protection, and when you are absolutely certain of his promise. Now, Psalm 91 gives us two amazing truths, and one of them is that there are times when God will deliver us physically from our trouble, and there are other times when he will not. There are some times when you're going to have to go through your stuff. So Psalm 91 isn't promising that you are going to escape trouble. Psalm 91 is saying trouble won't last always. And Psalm 91 is saying the other truth, that sometimes God will let you suffer, but he will not let it cause permanent damage. See, the marvelous thing is that, you, can, you know, if you go in with two legs and two arms, you expect to come out with two legs and two, two arms. But ask, ask Jacob. Sometimes when you have been blessed by God, you have to live with a limp. God does not promise My grandmother used to say flowery beds of ease. I haven't heard that in a long time. You all know what that is? Flowery beds of ease. God doesn't promise that. God promises that he'll be with us. And so let's let's deal with the first, and we're going to go through each of these 16 verses. First, it does not matter if God gives you a brick wall or a spider web, as long as you can find comfort in his presence. Listen to verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Now listen to this in Eugene Peterson's The Message. You who sit down in the high God's presence spend the night in Shaddai's shadow. Say this, God, you are my refuge, I trust in you, and I am safe. Now, it is believed that Moses was the one who wrote this psalm. But when you talk about God's presence, most people have no clue about what that means. They have no clue about how to accomplish it. And yet you know about presence. You know about having a love affair with someone. One of the things that I remember in the most important human relationship that I ever had, that we used to talk, this person and I, for hours, on the telephone, 
and in person. We would talk and talk and talk and talk. No text, no email, no Facebook, no Instagram, just actually sitting across the table, side by side, on the telephone, and we would talk. And the more that we talked, the closer we got. And the reason was that she told me secrets about herself. And I told her secrets about myself. And so it continued to grow and grow and grow. And that's the way it is in building a relationship with God. How many of you, without lying, will say that you spend at least one hour each day intentionally in the presence of God? Intentionally. So, you don't have to feel bad or guilty for what you're saying is I don't need him. You see, if you need him, if you need money, where do you go? To the bank or to, to, to one of your cousins or mom and them. You have to understand you cannot build a relationship with God without spending time with him. So how do you spend time with him? You spend time in his word. David said that thy word will I hide in my heart that I might not sin against you. You have to desire his presence. Comfort comes in his presence. So you immerse yourself in his word. You get up in the morning with his word. At noonday, you have his word. In the afternoon, you have his word. In the evening, you have his word. And what you find is that you are transformed in his presence. And then you have a conversation with him. How many of you pray at least a half hour every day? Half hour. Okay, a few hands. Do, 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 you, do you guys know what prayer is? That prayer is the lifeline that we have to God? You, you can't help but be upset with what's going on in the world because you serve a little God. You serve a God that's somewhere distant and you don't know him. What, what if every single day you got up and you said, I can't make this day without you. But we're so, we're so good at what we do, we can dress ourselves we can drive ourselves to work. We can drive ourselves to wherever we go, and we are great. And we get there. How many of you, ta- how many of you stop at work and say, Lord, I'm getting ready to go into a meeting, and Mary is in there. And if you don't, if you don't help me, I'm going to say something to Mary that could cause me to lose my job. Do y'all understand? But, but, but you say, you go in, and then Mary says something, and then you get in your feelings. And two or three weeks later, you're gone, and Mary's there. The believer who has made El Elyon, the most high God, his secret hiding place, will find shade and protection under the wings of El Shaddai, the Almighty. One of the things that uh, we have in our backyard is nine or ten oak trees. 
and they've been growing there for 18 to 20 years, close to the time that we've been living at the house, so maybe 18 years. And, and an amazing thing has happened, that it's, not, it's what, what was it yesterday, 109? I actually walked outside and was under the tree, and it felt like it was 15 or 20 degrees cooler. And all I was in was the shade. And so what the psalmist is saying is that when God is your shade, you won't just be cool. You'll be protected. You'll be cared for. But you have to seek the shade of his arms, of his wings, underneath his everlasting arms. One of the things that we lose sight of the fact that most of us are not even sensitive to the fact that God is present. How many of you know he's present here now? Okay. Do you sense his presence? So, so someone said yes. So, so you don't have to answer me, but how? How do you know he's here? If he left, would you know? The marvelous thing is that this is not about feeling. This is about your lifeline. If they cut off your oxygen, you would know. If you didn't eat for 10 days, you would know. And so if we don't practice his presence, we'll never know when he's gone. The amazing, and, and, and we don't have to see him physically. At times my wife will tell me, just having me in the house is all that she requires, just to know that if she calls, I'll answer. When was the last time you called and he said, here am I? Calm down. I've got it. There's a difference between protection and a sense of security. If you know God has got it, what do you do? You go to bed. And you don't need pills. You just, you just, have you ever watched a baby? And a baby after you, after you feed the baby? Okay, and then you, you holding the baby and the baby's secure. What does the baby do? Why? Because the baby feels absolutely secure. When that baby gets to be two years old and you take her to the children's ministry, what does the baby do then? Baby yells and screams and reaches for the parent. Why? Separation anxiety. I don't think God's people know what separation anxiety is. If he left the room, And so he's saying that if you have a personal relationship with me, if you live daily in my strength, if you depend upon me completely, then what's going on in the world won't matter to you. You go vote, get in your car, and drive on. Oh, by the way, did y'all know that, that God lives in Washington too? God went to Helsinki. Okay, God sits on the Supreme Court. Oh my, our world is falling apart. They've taken over. God is sovereign. God is in control. There is nothing that can happen that he does not allow to happen. But he does want you to get up off of your lazy and register and go vote. That's your part. Not you complaining. Oh, what are we going to do? Wringing our hand. Oh, my goodness. You, if God is in you, anybody got, anybody got a big brother who used to fight for them? 
You, you know how when you, when, when, you, when you get in a little scrape and then you know you got your brother standing behind you and so you just go ahead and hit the boy. Why? Because your brother is behind you. Don't you understand the battle is not yours? Okay, let's move on. Let's. Everything in our lives, our marriages, our jobs, our relationships, they all depend upon an awareness of God's presence and his protection. There is, you can have a good marriage if God is in there with you. I didn't say you're going to have an enjoyable marriage. I didn't say you were going to have a satisfactory marriage. I said you can have a marriage. Yeah, you, you, that's, another, that's another whole deal. Okay, if, you, if you marry the devil, you have to expect the devil to be the devil. You kind of have to check that before you take them home. When the enemy attacks come, you have to be able to know I am in no danger. That's knowing that you are protected. That is knowing cancer. What can, I, I've had cancer. So what can cancer do for you? Cancer can make you absolutely miserable and it can take your natural life. But the fact is that my, if your life is hid in him, all cancer can do is rush you on to the place that you want it to be anyway, except that you didn't want to really be there. You want to stay here and complain about the president. Oh, how terrible is our, the, the world. And, and God is saying, come on home, honey. Isn't that ironic that everybody's talking about heaven, but nobody wants to go? We need to be able to know that God is and that it shuts out all this other noise. If you hear the commentary, all you have to say to the commentator, God is watching you. If you are telling a lie, guess what? God hates liars. You don't have to fix the liar. Please. Simmer down, pot roast. God is. They can attack the fortress, but they cannot get in. He is our shield. He is our bulk. He's already put protection around us so that nothing can come near us. You say, you say but it feels like it, Pastor. You know, I'm, I'm being pummeled. I'm being beaten. Okay, then talk to some of these people who go to the gym every day. They go beat themselves up deliberately. And you don't hear, oh, you know, I'm here pumping iron. It's so terrible. They deliberately, sometimes we have to beat our bodies into submission in obedience to the one who called us. We are weenie Christians. Trouble comes. <laughs> when was the last time you said, bring it on, devil? Because you better, you better be, you better know who you know. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so, so, so Isaiah 41, 10 said, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, the second part of this is if, if it does not matter if God gives us a brick wall or a spider web as long as we have confidence in his presence. Now, let's work through verses 3 through 13. 
It says, For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. He is saying that God's protection is like no other protection on the planet. That he has surrounded you so that absolutely nothing will get to you. What you have to get over is the pain you feel while you're going through something. Because you are going to think that that is the enemy getting the victory over you, and that is God testing you to get you ready for the next trial that you're going to have to go through. Because the next one is up the road. I I just can't believe how, how my grandmother had more theology than I ever imagined. She says, if it ain't one thing, it's another all the time. So that means that you're coming out of one storm and you're going into another storm and it's going to seem like you cannot make it and you cannot on your own. But as long as God is your protection, he goes on. He says, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrows that fly by day or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. It's amazing how we have uh, flu, flu uh, epidemics, uh, we have had Ebola, uh, we have had all of these things, and they have caused us pause, and we're thinking this is the end of the world. But the fact is that God has all of this under control. What you have to do... Okay, now, if they discover uh, E. coli on lettuce, so, so what do you do? You go buy all the lettuce you can... And you uh, make all the salads you can, and you enjoy it, right? No! You stop eating lettuce, at least for a minute. That's why God gives you the brain. He, he, he is going to protect you, but he's going to protect you with sense. Some people, God expects you to use the brain that you have. You have someone in front of you saying, I'm not good for you. I'm only into me, okay? I don't mean you any good. I'm going to play you. Okay, so, so she or he is telling you. But you say, oh, you know, the Lord is good. You know, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to pray that God will change your life. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. This may be the most challenging part of this for me. Uh, I watched uh, a video, and videos don't tell the whole story, but it was a stand-your-ground situation in in Florida where a man um, was harassing another man's wife and he, ca- he walked up and he pushed the man down. And when he turned to move away, the man took out his gun and shot him dead. And the police say that it was consistent with the law, that that's the stand-your-ground law. The man felt threatened, so he could use deadly force. So I see a situation like this, and I'm saying, okay, God, shouldn't you do something? Shouldn't you intervene? Shouldn't you go to Florida? I felt the same way with Trayvon Martin. And I'm thinking, God, you should do something. And over and over and over again, the message comes back. I am doing something. He says, but you wouldn't understand it if I told you. This whole thing with Russia... You need to understand that Russia is in the apocalypse. America is not. You can search Revelations. You can search Daniel. You can search the Scriptures. America is not there. So if you are making your home here, you can rest assured that your home is going away. So you better have another building. 
not made with hands. And see, don't worry, don't worry about the power from the east. That's the way it's portrayed in Scripture. The power from the east. Gog and Magog. It's there. It's just being played out. It, it just, that, it, it's not happenstance that it's Russia. Russia is all over the scriptures. And what we have to do is we have to continue to press toward the mark. We need to understand that we are secure. It doesn't matter whether America is ever great again. We're not going to live here. Why, why are you all upset about that? Most of us are close enough. We are much closer to heaven than we are. Raise your hand if you're north of 50. Raise your hand. That's our peeps right there, boy. Let me move on. He says, you will look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. You know what he's saying? He's saying you're going to see them get theirs. God has already reserved it. God already has a plan. God already knows what he's going to do, and we are all going to be witnesses. See, because when I check out, as I will check out. He has promised when he comes back, he's going to bring me with him. See, there are going to be some folks that when he, when he comes back, the earth is going to open. And the dead in Christ are going to get up. I'm kind of like Paul. You know, I want to live... But living is so aggravating. Dying to live, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. When you get there, then you realize that God is your protection. In verse 9, he says, for you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. And look at verse 11, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You know, the devil is pretty tricky. The devil used this scripture in Matthew 4. Remember when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was fasting for 40 days and after he hadn't eaten for 40 days, the devil came up and he said, look, he took him up to a high place, a pinnacle. And he says, I will give you Everything that you can see, if you'll just jump off. Now, the first thing that you need to realize is Satan was trying to give Jesus what he already owned. <laughs> the second thing is that he was mistaking the scripture out of context because the issue was God's support for his people. It wasn't some game that the devil wanted to play. And so Jesus said, uh-huh. Well, it also says that you need to stop messing with God. You should not put him to the test. In other words, you have to be careful when you start talking about, well, God, if you don't do this or if you don't do that, then I am not going to. Don't, don't go down that road. And, and see, a lot of people, when they get disenfranchised, uh, they leave the church. Okay, don't do that either. Okay, let me tell you why. Because when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for the church. He's coming back for his people. And that you can be disillusion you can be upset you can be angry sometimes I get very very angry with God 
because things don't work the way that I want them to work. And then I realized that he did not, he did not set this thing up to please me. You need to understand that when you choose to follow Jesus Christ, that's when it gets difficult. Not, not, not you, don't, you, you don't follow Jesus Christ so it becomes easy. You expect it to become difficult. He says in verse 13, you will tread on the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. In other words, he's saying that there is no enemy that you cannot vanquish. But the problem is that you don't have a clue about the power and the protection that you have. I've, I've given you illustration, an illustration and, um, about a man who, who was cutting firewood. And, and he was given this brand new device to cut firewood. But he couldn't cut anymore. In fact, he cut less wood with his new device but the fact is that he didn't realize that he had been given a power saw and he was trying to use it the way he used his old saw. Some of you are trying to live like you used to live. Some of you are trying to keep a measure of your old life. There are times when people will ask me, is this okay? If you have to ask if it's, if it's okay, then you already know what? It's not okay. Because you have a moral compass. You actually know. And so you have to make the judgment to say, this is not okay. Now, how much of you does God want? How much of you does God want? How much of you does God want? Okay, so... Why don't we give him all? Because we want to keep some for ourselves. We want his protection. We want his covering. But we want to keep some of ourselves for us. Our pet sins. And for some of us, it's just our feelings. There's someone in here who needs to forgive someone for an egregious thing that's happened in their lives. But you are unable to. And you say to yourself, I've forgiven them, I'm just not going to forget. You know the amazing thing? When you forgive someone, there's nothing to remember. You know how somebody owes you money and you say, well, you're going to let it go? But you also say what? I'm not going to let them have no more money. Okay, you know what that means? You haven't forgiven the debt. What, 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 what God says is, I'll cast it as far from you as the east is from the west. You'll never see it again. We want God's protection, but we want to live our lives the way we used to live them. You say it doesn't make any sense to lend money to somebody who won't pay you back. Well, all the money that you have was given to you. Oh, but I work for it. I earned it. I, I, it's, it's my education. It's my experience. Well, where did all that come from? So we're going to close with the certainty of his promises. Look at verses 14. He says, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with a long life. I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Okay. As we close our time together, what I want all of you to understand is that the promises of Psalm 91 are only for believers. The promises of Psalm 91 are only for believers. People who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. Who have been born again. And that his promises 
are to his people. And he's saying, because you have loved me, I will be your protection. Because you have trusted me, I will be your everything. The challenge that we have as we close, brothers and sisters, is that God wants our everything. The most painful part of sanctification is the fact that we have to give ourselves up. God is calling us to be more and more like him. But in order to do that, he has to live in us. We cannot do it in our own strength. We have to die. And dying means that you have nothing that you bring to the table. Nothing. The, the choir sang beautifully today. But the fact is that if you did that on your own, it just went into the air. If you did it to appease the congregation, it was worthless. But if as you worshiped, you realize that there's an audience of one, and that it didn't matter how melodious, it didn't matter how well it went together, but the fact is that my soul was surrendered to him completely. And that in your life, this week, this week, if you're going to go out and live this week like you lived last week, if you're going to go out and continue to do the things that you, and there's no, no change, no understanding that God is our protection. God is our protection. I'm going to do something different. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate the time I spend watching the news. Because I watch the news and all I do is walk away angry. I don't walk away informed because I don't know who's telling the truth. And so what good is it? Oh, you're going to be informed. Informed of what? The craziness? What if you took the half hour that you watch the news and spend it immersed in prayer and pray for the nation or pray for the president or pray for the Congress to pray for those who are struggling? We, we have natural disasters all over our country, um, um, tornadoes. We have all kinds of things going on. It's supposed to be uh, 108 or 109 degrees. Do you know that there are people who are staying outside? That's our, that's our mission. We can't change it by watching Fox or CN, CNN or MSNBC or CBS or um, the other people. We cannot, but we can change it if we allow one who called us to fill us to overflowing with his presence. His presence. Now, I want to speak to those of you who don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I get an opportunity to do this at the end of every message that I preach. But I want to try to make this clearer than I have ever made it before. The first thing that I want everyone in here to understand is that we were all born in a state that was unacceptable to God. We were born as enemies. And that whether or not you accept, whether or not you accept it, that's really up to you. But we have to agree with God that we are who he says we are. So he says that we're sinners. You're not sinners because you lied or because you did something um, that was against the law. That didn't make you a sinner. You did that because you are a sinner. What makes you a sinner is that you were born 
with sin, a sin nature. There's only one remedy for it. And that's the blood of Jesus. There's only one way for you to be changed from who you were born as to who God wants you to be. And it's called being born again. And the marvelous thing is that God has already taken care of your problem. How cool is that? God already sent his son and he's already died. And so the fact that you were born with this stuff has already been taken care of. He's saying, I will not hold that against you because my son took it. My son took what you should have gotten and that's all done. It's paid for. He says, but my, my, my concern for you is that you have to accept the gift. I wish I had mine. I don't have, all I have is a, okay, so I can't offer anybody that. Okay, if I had money, okay, I would offer you money. And if I offered you money, Mr. Dale, if I offered you money, okay, what would you have to do with the money to make it yours? You'd have to take it. But as long as, it's my, as long as it remains in my hand, whose money is it? It's mine. Okay, so, so God has prepared salvation for you, but it's still in his hands. And it won't be yours until you take it. You say, but how do I take it, Pastor Smith? How do I take the gift that God has given to me? That you have to decide that you need the gift. You see, only lost people get saved. Only people who have the need, Larry, who actually understand they have the need, get the transformation. It's not like a flu shot. They can just give flu shots whether you need them or not. You can't get salvation until you realize you don't have it. And so, so then, once you realize that you don't have it, how do you get it then, Pastor Smith? You just believe. You just say, I receive. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe that he was buried and that God raised him from the dead. That once you believe, you say, Pastor, but believing is so hard. No, it's not. This is, this is the stage. Okay, I'm standing. Now I'm leaning. How am I leaning? Because the stage is holding me up. How did I, how did I get on the stage? I actually believed that the stage would hold me up. So if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and you are willing to accept his salvation, you will at that moment pass from death into life. We you say, Pastor Smith, pass from death into life? Oh, that, that's, that's a mystery to you because you don't know you're dead. That's the problem. P dead people don't know they're dead. Did you know that? If we, have a, if we had a coffin laying out here and we try to talk to the dead person, they, they can't hear. They don't know. So, but God is giving you, God even gives you the faith to believe. Right now, God is working in somebody's life and he's saying, I know you have the inner, you, you are not able to believe, but I'm going to give you the faith. I'm going to give you the faith right now that will allow you to get up and put your trust in Jesus Christ. He's going to do that for you. But, but, so, so you're going to feel your legs strengthen and you're going to get up. And you're going to say, Pastor Smith, will you, in, will you introduce me to Jesus Christ so I can live eternally with him? And so we're going to pray and then I'm going, to op I'm going to give you that opportunity. And so you expect that God will give you the faith and that you will come this morning. Let's pray. Father, moving by your spirit, there's someone here this morning who wants to be a part of your family. 
They want to go from being dead to being alive in Jesus Christ. Give them that faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if there's, if there's one who God has given the faith to say, I want to know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I want you to get up right now. I want you to come and